I'll begin by thanking Father Sirica and Sirico and the Acton Institute for the honor of being a participant in this year-long celebration of Centesimos Anos. The problem is when you're one of the speakers coming toward the end of the year and so many illustrious uh, theologians and others have already said many things about Centesimos Anos. What is there left to say? Uh, but I'm encouraged by the little folk tale that we all know about the juggler who went to the statue of the Virgin Mary and he wanted to know what he could offer and he said, well, I'll just do what I usually do, I'll juggle. And uh, I'm a social scientist, a lawyer, we, we call ourselves social scientists, and uh, I thought as my contribution to this great celebration that I would offer a few reflections about the implications of Centesimus Anos for the human sciences, the social sciences. So all of us, I'm sure, reread Centesimus Anos for this occasion, and uh, one can't help being struck when you're in the presence of a great text that each rereading brings out something that you didn't see before. And uh, in my work for the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences, I found that rereading it for this week's celebration and for this week's meeting, plenary session of the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences, there were a number of features of the encyclical that jumped out at me. And I would characterize these features as, uh, on the one hand, encouraging and gratifying, and on the other hand, as deeply challenging. So I'll get the encouraging part out of the way first. I can say it in a sentence. It is very encouraging to see how here and elsewhere in his writings, John Paul II showed that he had a great esteem for the social sciences. In fact, we now know that when he wrote Centesimus Anus, he already had in mind the plan to establish a Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences in order to put the dialogue between the church's social doctrine and the social sciences on a more regular and systematic basis. So in 1994, three years after Centesimus Anus, he issued a motu proprio and created our statutes where he gave our academy two jobs. One, to contribute to the progress of the social sciences and two, to offer the church elements that may be useful to her in the development of her social doctrine. Now, that was 13 years ago. And after 13 years of trying to fulfill those responsibilities, I would say most of my colleagues in the academy would agree that we are only beginning to cope with the depth of the challenges that he laid out for us in the encyclical. Let me begin with the encyclical's implicit challenge to certain habits and methods that are pervasive in the social sciences. I'll mention three. To take the most obvious instance, he tells us about the unity of knowledge and why that requires interdisciplinary cooperation. Obvious, you'll say. Of course you need interdisciplinary cooperation. But do you have any idea how it, hard it is to get 30 people in one room, economists, political scientists, lawyers who have a certain reputation for being contentious, and uh, sociologists, and to try to get them to break out of the boundaries of their disciplines and actually speak to each other. So huge problem that just comes from the intrinsic, the, the fragmentation of human knowledge in the course of increasing complexity of human knowledge. But add to that, and here we get into the area of the fallen nature of human beings, uh, there are rivalries among the disciplines, and there's the occasional impulse toward imperialism. Uh, some disciplines think they have the key to explain everything. And I won't mention which of the social sciences is particularly guilty of that, but it isn't law. <laughs> uh, 
A second way in which he challenged our epistemology is in his well-known emphasis on the importance of an adequate anthropology. Who could deny, and here we really have to say mea culpa, who could deny that the social sciences have contributed more than their share to faulty anthropologies? We in the academy became increasingly aware of that problem, and I think one accomplishment that we can point to is that in 2005 we devoted a whole plenary session to examining the implicit conceptions of the human person in economics, law, political science. And we brought to the conscious level those assumptions with which we operate and we came, I think, to the conclusion that concepts like economic man, which can be extremely useful if they're tools for analytical purposes, can wreak havoc if they escape from the toolbox. You have to keep them in the right place. But perhaps, and I'll just mention one more challenge of this nature, perhaps the most deeply challenging aspect of Centesi Masanos for us social scientists is its treatment of truth. It's warning about the way that agnosticism and relativism are becoming the philosophy and the basic attitude that correspond to the way of life we now live. And here again, mea culpa, social scientists clearly bear more than their share of the responsibility for the spread of those attitudes and for ignoring the consequences of those attitudes for the very things that most of us cherish, uh, human rights and the relief of man's estate. As the Pope pointed out, if there is no truth, the force of power takes over, people become means and objects to be exploited, there's no basis for human dignity, no basis for human rights. But at the same time that he warned us against that attitude, he was very careful while affirming truth to caution against the various fundamentalisms, including what we now call the dictatorship of relativism, the various fundamentalisms that claim the right to impose their view on others. He said, because human life is realized under conditions that are diverse and imperfect, we must pay attention to every fragment of truth that we can find in our own experience and in the experiences of other cultures and nations. Now, let me move from these uh, epistemological and methodological challenges to some areas where the challenges involve specific problems in the social sciences and specific, let us say, lacunae in the church's social teaching. As we all know, Centesimus Annus is noted for its appreciation of liberal democracy and the free market. But, at the same time, its author cautions against the habits that are formed in freedom that can set the stage for the loss of freedom. What I think is the most difficult part of Centesa Mosanos for us social scientists, especially us lawyers. He says, if we're to realize the benefits of democracy and the market, we have to find ways to minimize their explosive, their destructive potentials by disciplining their energies within a juridical framework, undergirded by a healthy moral culture. Well, who can disagree? But, as they say, the devil is in the details. What could it mean? One wonders in practical terms. How would you ever do that? What kinds of juridical arrangements could temper free politics and free economics without stifling them, without killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. And, equally difficult question, if a nation or a culture's moral foundations are crumbling, what on earth could law, politics, economics, or sociology ever do to build them up again? I must confess it hasn't been easy for our academy to move from the level, we're great at identifying problems, but when you come to specific recommendations, uh, we've had a hard time in 13 years. So I'd like to devote the remainder of my remarks to the few things that we've learned 
as we've tried to understand the implications of just one concept, just one concept, a concept that has emerged in every single area that we have studied, the concept of subsidiarity. So we all know that the concept of subsidiarity is pervasive in Catholic social thought, but in Centesimus Annus there was an important move when John Paul II linked that concept to the, another concept that he called human ecology. He noted that the first and fundamental structure of human ecology was the family, where we first learn what it means to be a person, and of course person has a very special meaning here. And he commented that, here's one of those sentences that jumps out on a rereading. He commented that the destruction of human environments is by no means receiving the attention it deserves and that too little effort is being made to safeguard the moral conditions for an authentic human ecology. There it seemed to us that he was outlining a Herculean task for the social sciences. And as time has gone on, we have tried to adopt that ecological perspective and I'll say a few words about where that has led us, beginning with what we call our intergenerational solidarity project. That's a very awkward term. We could have done better with that. But what it dealt with, by 1991, when Centesimus Annus was issued, by that time, the developed countries of the world had undergone what uh, one of our speakers at the Academy, Francis Fukuyama, called the Great Disruption, those enormous, accelerating, turbulent social changes that transformed family life, relations between the sexes, roles of the sexes, uh, transformed them everywhere. Those changes impaired the family's ability to nurture and educate children, and it impaired, they impaired the family's age-old role as a support institution for its dependent members. And the ripple effects from those changes transformed all the mediating structures of civil society. So there was a vicious circle where the mediating institutions, neighborhoods, churches, etc., the mediating institutions could no longer count on families, especially couldn't count on the unpaid labor of women, and thus they themselves were less able to serve as resources for families. And to make matters worse, the welfare state, by aiming to relieve families of some of their responsibilities for their weaker members, often aggravated the very situations it was meant to help. And now, of course, we are in a situation where, with globalization, nation states are becoming weaker, and yet their citizens are still looking to their governments to respond to the very disruptions that economic globalization has brought about. So it does not seem an exaggeration to say that our social environments are in crisis. But as with natural ecology, it's not easy to discern how probabilities might be shifted to revitalize the social ecology, families and other fragile institutions. We social scientists had to admit that we don't know very much about how to encourage or even about how to avoid damage to the social systems that undergird and buffer the free market and the free society. Thinking in ecological terms did, however, suggest some tentative conclusions and areas for further study. So, for example, uh, it seemed clear to us that any social policy, any family policy that focuses on families alone without attending to the health of the institutions, the social environment of the family was bound to fail. So far as the role of law is concerned, the imperfect state of our knowledge suggests proceeding modestly, preferring pilot programs, local experiments, to standardized top-down regulation. Where family policy is concerned, we felt we need to recognize that a nation that does not have an explicit family policy 
has an implicit family policy, one that is encoded in, pro in programs and practices that have an impact on family life, tax law, for example. Regarding pilot programs, one of the most promising ecological ideas in the sense of the encyclical is the one that was proposed long ago by Peter Berger and Richard Newhouse, the idea that many social services, education, uh, health care, can be delivered more effectively, efficiently, and humanely through the mediating structures, including religious institutions, than they can by government. A sensible idea, you would say, one that ought to be tested, try it out. But thus far, there's been enormous political difficulty in testing the idea, at least so far as the participation of religious institutions is concerned. There, the legal systems have thrown up many impediments. And moving to another topic that the Academy has studied, the dilemmas of democracy, again, impediments surface when one tries to think about the implementation of the subsidiarity principle in practical terms. So here's the way we phrased it in our report on democracy. Free societies seem to have difficulty generating the very habits upon which they depend. And we speculated that the path to correction might lie in accepting a proposition that many friends of liberal democracy find difficult to entertain, even shocking. The proposition that democratic states and free markets ought to refrain from imposing their own values indiscriminately on all the institutions of civil society. We wrote that to play their role effectively in the ecology of democracy, families and the mediating structures need not necessarily be democratic, egalitarian, or liberal. Their highest loyalty need not and should not be to the state, and their highest values need not and should not be efficiency and productivity. Claude Levi-Strauss wrote something like that 30 years ago, uh, and uh, it fell like a stone in uh, French social science. And so far as I know, our democracy project uh, has not won many converts, but uh, that's the conclusion we came to. Finally, I want to say something about uh, subsidiarity in our studies of globalization and in the meeting that we had uh, that just concluded yesterday. Um, two years ago, the uh, then Holy See Minister for Relations with States, Archbishop Laiolo, wrote to us and suggested that it would be helpful to the Holy See and interesting for us to explore the implications of subsidiarity for international relations. Uh, and in truth, that concept, we usually discuss it when we're talking about mediating structures of civil society within a nation state, and of course in quadragesimo anno, that was the context, but the concept is rather undeveloped when it comes to international relations. But as we started to ponder the implications for international relations, we became aware of the need to address some internal tensions in Catholic social thought. I'll mention one in the area of poverty and development and another in the area of international institutions. So Centesimus Anus, one of the many parts of Centesimus Anus that uh, I think Catholics have taken to heart and have repeated over and over again to the point where it has become almost a mantra for us is the relief of poverty requires bringing the poorest peoples and countries into the circle of productivity and exchange. We say that very frequently. But John Paul II himself complicated that prescription on various occasions by cautioning that the market, the circle of productivity and exchange, if you will, imposes its own way of thinking and acting and stamps its scale of values on behavior. 
He said globalization often risks destroying the carefully built structures of civil society by exacting the adoptions of new styles of working, living, and organizing communities. Accordingly, he advised that globalization must respect the diversity of cultures. In particular, it must not deprive the poor of what remains most precious to them, including their religious beliefs and practices. So, Here's a real challenge, a real dilemma. How do we bring the poorest peoples and cultures into the circle of productivity and exchange without destroying the cultural environments that give point and purpose and meaning to their lives? I just raise the question. If anybody can answer it, I will nominate you for a Nobel Prize, a double prize, peace and economics. Okay. <laughs> So if that were not challengingly challenging enough, here's another area of, if not tension, I don't say contradiction, but if it's not tension within Catholic social thought, it at least is an area where it's very difficult to keep two things in the right balance. And here I'm referring to the fact that in Centesimus Annus and elsewhere, the Holy Father refers to the rights of nations and he emphatically affirms the rights of nations. And in fact, when he addressed the UN in 1995, he said, we need to develop a theory of the rights of nations by analogy to our rights of persons. That's pretty emphatic. Yet at the same time, and uh, as we all know, at, uh, at, on many occasions, the Holy See has expressed with equal emphasis its enthusiastic support for international institutions. So how do we hold those things together? As a distinguished previous lecturer in this series, George Weigel has noted, there is not only that tension in the thought, but a tension in practice between the role of the church, Holy See diplomacy as a moral witness, as a distinctive voice on the international stage, and the pressures of everyday diplomacy. And he suggests, therefore, that it is time for Catholic international relations theory to undertake a critical reevaluation of international institutions and how they actually do or do not promote freedom, justice, security, and what we know as the, the peace of order. That is, peace isn't just, in, in Catholic thought, peace is not just the absence of conflict, peace is the peace of order. Just as the church cannot affirm the nation state as the final form of human organization, political organization, Weigel cautions, she cannot assume that everybody that labels itself international absolutely represents an advance for humanity. Now that suggestion is so sensible that one has to wonder why so many discussions of international law and international institutions are characterized, characterized by a, a rather uncritical acceptance of internationalism. Once again, mea culpa, and here probably international lawyers, uh, the community to which I belong, are uh, as much to blame as anybody. Why? Well, political theorist Peter Berkowitz recently pointed out, I'll quote, the dominant view in the US legal academy, a view which closely resembles the consensus among European elites and is associated with the European Union's self-understanding, the dominant view is that international law has an identifiable content and its content corresponds to a progressive interpretation of government's obligations at home and abroad. In other words, the content of international law is what we in Cambridge and New York and London think it is, and everybody should agree with us. Um, as a legal comparatist, I would add to what Berkowitz said that uh, public international lawyers have developed a kind of professional culture. With rare exceptions, public international lawyers have developed a kind of professional culture that 
is indifferent at best and hostile at worst to the idea that there is a legitimate pluralism in forms of freedom. That expression, John Paul II in his 1995 speech to the UN, legitimate pluralism in forms of freedom. That is much contested. I would say that the dominant view in, uh, pub among public international lawyers is uh, uncomfortable with that idea. So finally, in the face of all these difficulties and challenges, I come to the question so famously posed and so disastrously answered by Lenin, what is to be done? Centesimus Anus does not leave us entirely without guidance. One of the most important messages of John Paul II's personal witness and work is that the path out of a vicious social cycle begins with the recognition that we human beings are not helplessly trapped within institutions. Human beings are capable of reflecting upon their existence and in making judgments concerning whether the society they live in is the kind of society they wish for their children and for future generations. Those judgments, of course, can be powerfully influenced, biased by personal bias, group bias, cultural bias, general bias, the settings in which we find ourselves. But those settings, in turn, can be influenced to some extent by reflection and choice, the faith of the authors of Federalist I in the United States. But there lies the greatest challenge of all. Will we, who have had the blessing of living in free societies, will we be able to shift probabilities in a direction favorable to the maintenance of those societies? One thing seems certain. The enemies of, Christian, of Christianity, the enemies of free societies, the enemies of the free market are watching and waiting to see whether the civilizations of Europe and America will survive the fallout from the vast social experiments and social changes of the late 20th century. Centesimus Anus will stand forever as a reminder that seemingly indestructible regimes could be and were brought down by countless men and women who were determined to live in truth and to call good and evil by name. Now it is up to us to prove that free societies can be preserved in the same way by human persons acting intelligently and choosing wisely. Thank you.